Hello, everybody. Carrie here. Welcome to Humane Voices. Uh, we are missing Austin again today. So we have uh, producer Pat, or as we know him, substitute Austin. Uh, how are you doing, producer Pat? Everything okay? Hey, you know, I'm moving up in the world to become a substitute, <laughs> substitute for Austin. Substitute Austin. So <laughs> take it. <laughs> Last time I said I was sitting on the bench ready to go. This is what I'm here for. Don't worry, Pat. Eventually, we're, you're, he's going to be known as substitute Pat. We'll, we'll get there. <laughs> Hey, so for all of us, we have a great guest here today, um, and it is our our director of outreach and research for the Puppy Mill campaign, Kathleen Summers. Um, and so, to to get into her uh, her conversation with us, we thought we would start off by playing a little game with you. So, um, we're gonna we're gonna kick that off uh, right off the bat here. Um, we're going to play a game with you guys called Puppy Mill Double Speak. And Kathleen and Pat are going to compete for absolutely nothing. No prizes are involved, no cash, no nothing. And you're not going to win a puppy. Um, but hopefully we can have a little bit of fun with what is uh, frequently a very depressing subject. Um, and then we can get into some more sort of serious conversations. So kicking it off now, um, I am going to talk a little bit about... Puppy Mill Doublespeak, and what we mean here is it, the game, the context for this game show is the doublespeak we're talking about is sort of the way that I, during the pandemic, will say things like, I'm going to clean up the bedroom, and I'm going to clean up the bedroom actually means I'm going to sit in bed and watch Die Hard for the 30th time while I occasionally sort of sock. Um, or for example, I'm going to get, I'm going to get some exercise. And what I mean is I'm going to bake a cake, but I'll be standing up while I'm doing it and moving around the kitchen. Puppy mills we find engage in sort of a similar sort of double speak. And so we're going to do a little quiz on that, um, that I, I hope our contestants will be able to, uh, sort through. So let's get started. Uh, question number one, uh, when a puppy mill says... Ours is a family business. We raise healthy puppies on our 20 acre farm. Kathleen and Pat, what does that actually mean? Anyone have a guess? I think I have a guess. So, Go for it, Pat. I mean, you know, family business is important. That's great. So that's something that you love to hear. You want to support small family businesses. Uh, raise, you know, healthy puppies. Great that they highlighted that, right? And uh, 20 acre farm. I mean, I grew up on like a five acre plot of land in the middle of a country. So 20 acres, that's pretty big. That's got to be a lot of places to, you know, a lot of, lot to run around, even if it's fenced in. I think that sounds great. I like where this is going. All right, Pat, I'm sorry. Your answer is incorrect. Kathleen, can you steal? Well, unfortunately, um, most uh, puppy mills are on some type of family owned plot of land, but uh, the dogs usually are not running around in those in those many acres that we hear about uh there the, the hallmarks of puppy mills are that they're typically kept in small wire stacked cages um and yes it may be a technically a family-owned farm but often the, it's not what you would believe it's not a wholesome operation where the dogs are getting regular attention and love all right so second question when a puppy mill says my puppies come with a health guarantee what does that mean I don't know. I mean, I, you know, I, I've, I've never actually had a puppy. So I'm assuming it's probably like some kind of nice certificate that, you know, when you're, when you're, when you get the puppy, here's the, you know, here, here's the bill of health, like literally a bill of health. I think that's uh, what it means. I'm, I'm kind of new to this. So okay, I, I trust so them on that. I'm going to semi buzz this, but Kathleen, maybe you could come in and give us a more elaborate answer here. <laughs> Mostly I just want to use the squeaker just, just to be clear. <laughs> Uh, the health guarantees that are offered by, by pet stores as well as puppy mills are often written to protect the seller more than the buyer. Um, so a person should read them very carefully. They, they may say, for example, this, this health condition isn't covered, this health condition isn't covered, and, and it'll be their most common health conditions like, um, you know, Giardia, these kinds of things. Um, and often they will cover something like kennel cough, which is very common. Um, often they will also require the buyer of the puppy to take the puppy either back to the pet store or to the breeder's vet if the puppy becomes sick, rather than taking the puppy to the, the nearest vet or, um, or the best vet available. So um, be very careful about that. So the, and the outcome of that, Kathleen, sometimes is, just stop me if I'm wrong, but the outcome is sometimes huge amounts of expense for a brand new pet owner and also potentially just pretty, pretty heartbreaking early moments with one's pet. 
Right. And we've seen some pet buyers spend thousands of dollars trying to save the life of their puppy at an emergency hospital right after just a few days after taking the puppy home. Maybe he has parvovirus or, or bronchitis. Um, and then they go back to the seller and say, hey, this puppy was sick and, you know, you said he was guaranteed to be healthy. Um, and they'll say, well, if you look at the fine print, you know, we said you couldn't take your puppy to an emergency vet. You had to bring him back to our vet. Mm -hmm. Well, their vet pr closed at five o'clock. <laughs> mm -hmm. So um, it's, yeah, it's, th those are often not, they're not in the favor of the buyer. All right. Another question. Um, when a puppy mill or a pet store claims that their, their operations or that the place that they got the uh, puppy from is, quote, USDA approved, what does that mean? You know, I, I got to break this, uh, this losing streak here. <laughs> so, I mean, it, I think that's, to me, that just sounds pretty straightforward. Approval or disapproval. And it sounds like approval is thumbs up. I think it's great. Kathleen, can you steal? Okay. Um, yes. Yeah, so, USDA licensed breeders, um, getting a USDA license is sort of like getting a driver's license. It means you met some bare minimum standards um, in, in, for those of us that drive, you know, but you, you've met bare minimum standards, you passed a driving test and you didn't crash into another car. Um, so, so for a puppy breeder getting a USDA license, it means that they had some, they met some basic requirements for cleanliness and so on. Um, but what the USDA doesn't prohibit, it doesn't prohibit puppy mills. It doesn't prohibit breeders from having dozens or even hundreds of dogs in small stacked wire cages where they live their entire lives without getting any human attention. Um, so a USDA licensed operation can still be a puppy mill. All right, so we'll have another one here. Uh, what does it mean when a pet store or a puppy mill or a, a puppy, puppy seller tells a customer, uh, all our puppies are AKC registered or that they have their papers. I th I'm pretty sure that means as the, you know, non, uh, you know, barely knowing anything consumer, uh, that, that is the American Kennel Club, which again, just sounds oops, good acronym. It sounds, I, I'm probably wrong, but it all sounds like it's probably fine, right? Oh, <laughs> uh, there, no, there it is, okay. Well, You're on a roll, Pat. <laughs> um, sadly, the AKC is not an animal welfare organization. Um, it's not even a dog welfare organization. Um, they are a pet registry organization. So if you have two golden retrievers uh, with papers, you can breed them together, sell the puppies, and register them with AKC. AKC does not come out and inspect you, approve you. Um, it doesn't look at the health of the mother and father dog that you registered. It, it only is a recording uh, organization that, you know, records the fact that both of your dog's parents were allegedly purebred. So, in fact, to make matters worse, the AKC, because they make money every time somebody registers a dog with them, they actually have taken a, a sort of a pro puppy mill stance. Unfortunately, they have regularly come out to oppose laws that would make life more humane for dogs and puppy mills. Right, because volume breeding in their case really benefits them financially, most likely. Sadly, yes. Yeah, okay. All right, so last question. Um, well, we might do one more, but semi-last question. All right, so if you are a puppy mill or if you are a, a, a puppy buyer and you found a just adorable puppy online that you really think is the right pet for you and you reach out to the seller and the seller says, yes, I'd love to sell you this puppy and why don't we meet in this, uh, this local parking lot rather than my place because my place is really hard to find. How should a customer interpret that? I've always, you know, you know, maybe it is, maybe it isn't hard to find, but I mean, like this might be where they, you know, with their family, where they live, you know, they, you know, maybe they want to be a little private of that, but also maybe they just want to meet somewhere in public, you know, like in, you know, a, you know, street lights, broad daylight, whatever it is, a place where other people are. So I, you know, I can look past that. <laughs> oh, for five. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Pat, we've really set you up to uh, to lose this here, obviously. It's okay. I'm learning, Carrie. You know, <laughs> that's one thing Austin isn't getting today. He isn't getting this valuable information, but we'll be sure to jump in this. Austin probably is off because he's tired of being humiliated on these podcasts anyway. <laughs> Kathleen, can you talk to us a little bit more about those circumstances and when they come up? 
Okay, well, we have to give Pat points for sensitivity. Yeah. Um, definitely. <laughs> All right, half a point. <laughs> point five out of five. Yeah, and yeah. definitely some readers will say this. They'll say, I, I don't want to bring people into my home. And during times of, you know, the pandemic has made us think a little differently about that. Um, but it's still important to go to the property. Um, if you do find uh, poor conditions, or maybe you don't even realize until later that you've been sold a sick puppy, you need to know who you bought that puppy from. And if you met them in the... Um, fast for fast food place parking lot, you don't even necessarily know who that person is or where they are and you can't report them to the right, um, to the right agencies. And we see that all the time. Mm. So it's important to at least go to the property. Not every breeder is going to tour, let you tour every room of their home. Um, but uh, it's important to see where the puppy was born and raised if you can. And um, to also see the mother dog, mm. to see if the mother dog looks happy and healthy if she's shying away from you when you're trying to pet her, then you know that's probably a dog that's been in a cage most of her life and hasn't been socialized. And that's an extreme red flag. All right. Well, thank you, contestants. I think we have a clear winner here. Um, Pat, thank, thank you for you. Thank so, you. for putting up with this, this <laughs> little game. Um, you know, to transition us into sort of some more serious conversation, you know, Kathleen, I think one of the things we wanted to talk to you about um, that I think probably lots of people in the humane field have experienced is, you know, everyone loves animals and we all have friends and family who may not be engaged in the field, but who, who consider themselves animal lovers and who love dogs and who will occasionally come to family gatherings or friend gatherings and say, I got a new puppy and I'm so excited and I got it from this great pet store. And so we wanted to get some sort of feedback from you about, you know, for, for folks who, who find themselves in those situations, you know, like how do you tend to handle that? This must come up for you a lot, especially given your sort of specialty. It's definitely something I struggle with um, because when I, I, I see somebody has a new puppy or they tell me about it, especially if, it's, if he or she is a purebred dog, I, often the first thing that comes to my mind is, is it probably came from a puppy mill. Um, it, sometimes I'm wrong. I, I recently, I was buying a new phone and the man, the salesman who was selling me the phone said, he found out somehow that I love dogs. I don't remember. We were talking about it. And he said, Oh, well, let, me, let me show you a picture of my Boston Terrier puppy. I love her so much. And I decided to shut my mouth a little bit and wait and, and hear a little bit more about his puppy. And he showed me a picture of a Boston Terrier puppy. And he said, I was so lucky to get this puppy. I decided to drop by my local animal shelter to do an act of kindness and bring them a box of donuts. And just as I was there, I was lucky enough to see somebody bringing this puppy in to surrender. And I immediately applied for the puppy. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, sometimes if we just wait a little bit and have a conversation, we find out it's not what we think it's going to be. Um, but, but unfortunately, more often than not, they'll say they bought the puppy from a pet store and you're like, ah, oh. and it's, it's hard because that's a situation where in a way the, the barn door is already open and the horse is already gone. Mm -hmm. um, the puppy so is already out the, out the barn door. The puppy is out the pet store door. <laughs> um, so I think you have to be a little bit careful because you don't want to alienate somebody immediately. Um, when they're, when they're talking about their puppy that they love so much, uh, to immediately say, your puppy probably came from a puppy mill. That was a really terrible thing to do. The puppy's mother will live in a cage the, her, the rest of her life. It, it's probably true, unfortunately. Um, but, uh, you know, sometimes you have to give people a, a little moment to be excited about their dog. Mm. And, um, and certainly it's probably, a, you know, all dogs are lovely no matter where they come from. But we don't want that person to think it's okay to go back and buy a second dog at that pet store. Uh, so I, I like to wait a little bit if I can and then sort of gradually ask about the animal's health. Mm. And I might say, hey, you know, you may, if, if the puppy is sick, I might suggest, uh, you know, you may want to have the puppy check out as soon as possible by a licensed vet because most pet store puppies are from puppy mills. You probably didn't realize that when you bought your dog. Um, but, you know, you mentioned your dog's been having a little sniffle and, you know, maybe she's a, a little bit shy with strangers. These are things you're going to want to have a vet look into. Um, and, you know, in the future, if you get another dog as a companion for your puppy, you may want to meet the breeder first and make sure that um, this is somebody that's well recommended, um, that has vet, vet, veterinary references, 
um, and meet the mother of your puppy and, and sort of segue into it that way. Yeah. So um, to transition into sort of the main topic for today, actually, um, Kathleen, the reason we have you here right now is because you have just, um, you know, not to like take the puppy metaphor too far, but you have just whelped your big project yeah. for the year. Um, you know, I know that this is this is a massive project, a huge undertaking that you take on um, annually at the QA, at the HSUS. And can you talk to us a little bit about the Horrible Hundred Report and what it is and, and what you hope to achieve with it? Well, every year we publish our annual Horrible 100 report to expose 100 puppy mills that have various problems to inform the public about the, the issues that are going on right now with puppy mills, where they are, uh, what types of problems are being found there, and um, to hopefully show the big picture of what's going on with puppy mills in America. And you know, of those, how many of, uh, how many of those puppy mills have connections to the AKC or are licensed by the USDA? Well, in this year's report, we found that about 40% of them are USDA licensed. Uh, we do believe that probably more than half of them should be USDA licensed, but not all of them have, have applied for the license mm -hmm. they're required to have. Um, other puppy mills, some that sell directly to the public, are not required to be licensed by USDA. Um, they may have a state license if they're in a state that requires them to be licensed, or they may have no license, and in some cases, that's not illegal. Um, but what we're finding is that even in the puppy mills that are both USDA and in some cases both USDA and state licensed, there are still significant problems. Um, there's still these small stacked cages that I mentioned. Um, that some of these places have been found with sick and injured dogs repeatedly. There's a, there's a puppy mill, for example, in Iowa called Stonehenge Kennel that is both state licensed and USDA licensed, which means it can legal, legally sell to pet stores all across the country. And they have had more than 50 injured or sick dogs found on their property mm. uh, since, wow. about, since about 2015 at their regular inspections, and yet they haven't been shut down. So Kathleen, so, with, with something like that, like does, when you see, when you're sort of going through the USDA and state reports that kind of help you generate the information about these mills, like what do you tend to see in terms of what the, you know, the inspectors who are supposed to be taking a look at these places and ensuring that the animals are being well taken care of, what do they find and what do they, what do they say to these mill owners about what they need to do? I mean, do they do anything? Well, they're documenting the violations, and um, in some cases, you know, it's not just up to the inspector. The inspector's job is to go there and document any mm -hmm. problems that they find. Um, the problem is that sometimes the laws just aren't strong enough, or the mm -hmm. enforcement, the will to enforce isn't strong enough, so that even if an inspector is finding a lot of problems and doing a good job of documenting them, um, that, for example, if it's a USDA inspector, the USDA isn't always taking it to the next level and saying, hey, this guy's had enough chances. Um, we're going to we're going to start taking moves to revoke his license. And in fact, um, over the last four years, the USDA has been increasingly stepping back on enforcement. And uh, COVID did not help with that. So the pan due to the pandemic, they for a long time paused many of their in person inspections. Mm. Um, but we're finding that even when they did go out and do some inspections and find violations. It's just recorded and the person has a slap on the wrist once again. Hmm. Um, so the, our report is a way of, of sort of bringing this to a wider audience and saying, hey, you know, these are the kinds of people that number one, nobody should be buying from them. And number two, that, you know, these are the situations that are hidden behind that pet store puppy that you're considering buying. Hmm. Your money when you buy this puppy from a pet store or, or on a, a website is going directly to these puppy mills that are keeping the mother of that puppy in prison for the rest of her life. And are we doing anything to encourage the USDA to, instead of stepping back, stepping forward and take things in the right direction, you know, make up for, for this lost progress? Uh, yes, we have a lot of plans in the works. Uh, there is a new director at USDA who's only been there a few months, and um, we hope uh, to, to meet with him or his staff at least and, and get him to consider regulatory changes that will improve the standards, as well as consider ramping up enforcement back to the levels it used to be. They used to have much stronger levels of enforcement where people would occasionally lose their licenses 
if they kept violating. Um, and also we have the Puppy Protection Act in Congress now that would increase those standards of care dramatically at USDA licensed facilities. So it would eliminate the cage stacking, it would eliminate the wire floors, it would require all dogs to have access to an outdoor run so they can enjoy the weather if it's nice out, and it would require temperature control indoors mm. so that if, you know, in the extreme weather, the dogs can have um, comfortable conditions, um, and it would uh, require twice a day feeding and all kinds of things that we think are common sense uh, that are not currently part of the law. Kathleen, just out of curiosity, I mean, when you guys are putting this report together, do you see sort of clusters in particular locations of puppy mills? Like, are there some states that are worse than others? And is there anything that you can sort of say, are there generalizations you can make around a, you know, are, if there are states that are worse than others in terms of puppy mill um, volume, you know, like, is, is there something driving that? Well, the puppy mills like to operate on in a farm like situation where mm. they're far from the road, you know, and, and far from prying eyes and ears. So the farming states do have a lot of puppy mills. Uh, Missouri has been number one for puppy mills in our report this year for the ninth year in a row. Mm. Um, the second one this year in the report was Ohio. It has 16 puppy mills in the report this year, uh, followed closely by Iowa, Nebraska, and Pennsylvania. Um, now, some of those states do have laws to require inspections of puppy mills, and so we are more a we're more likely to be able to get copies of those state level inspection reports, even when USDA is not inspecting. Uh, so, therefore, there there are some states like Missouri. We do we do have more records to put more dealers in the report, whereas its next door neighbor, Arkansas, doesn't have as many dealers in the report because it doesn't require state inspections. Mm. So unfortunately, there's probably just as many bad puppy mills in Arkansas, but we don't always know about them um, because nobody's been there. Right. So we can't sort of say, you know, like if you're a state that has a bunch of puppy mills on this list that you're necessarily doing worse than the state next to you that doesn't because that state may not even be having any sort of regulatory oversight. Is that correct? That's correct. And that's why if somebody is looking to buy a puppy, we, we don't want them to just take this list and say, oh, OK, my breeder's not on this list. Um, so she's probably if everything's okay. fine. Right. Yeah. You don't she's know in that. A state yeah. like Arkansas that doesn't inspect or even in a state like Oklahoma that is supposed to inspect but doesn't really, um, then she's not she's not going to be on the list. So it's it, that's why we ask people to check the place out for themselves. So I know that we've investigated into pet land and connections between pet land and puppy mills in the past. It, are there any connections between any of these horrible hundred and pet land that you might be able to discuss? Uh, well, we have done a number of undercover investigations of pet land. It is the, the only national chain of pet stores that still sells uh, puppies. So uh, we did find that at least 21 Petland stores purchased from breeders listed in this report. Uh, and the number is probably much higher because we don't have access to all of their shipping records. Um, but we do occasionally get some of them through Freedom of Information Act requests. And, and that's how we link at least 21 Petland stores to breeders in this report. And, and speaking of doublespeak that we were teasing about earlier, I mean, that's, that's the sort of thing that a lot of pet stores will say, oh, yes, we get from the best possible breeders and they're all home breeders and, you know, dogs frolicking on farms and things like that. Right. And um, the Petland specifically goes even further and says on their website and in their promotional materials that they hold their breeders to an even higher standard um, and require them, the breeders, to have even more play space for the dogs and this kind of thing. And um, what we discovered was that some of the breeders who we put in the report based on undercover photographs that showed dogs in these small stacked cages um, or small wire cages, these were the same breeders that were selling to Petland. So it is it, quite frankly a lie that, that all of Petland's breeders have these higher standards. Um, mm. because we have photographs of the outside of their kennels where these dogs, in some cases, the dog couldn't even jump for joy without her head hitting the top of the cage. Um, and, and good breeders are out there. There are good dog breeders, but they don't sell to pet stores or online because they want to meet the people who are taking home their puppies. I mean, if you think about how much love and care a responsible dog breeder puts into raising a litter of puppies, um, you can imagine that they wouldn't want to just put them on a truck and have them sent to a store and then resold to somebody that they never met. 
Yeah, I have a particular experience with that when I was when I was a kid, you know, before we really got into sort of shelter adoption and and kind of learned more about that. You know, my family went and bought a dog from a a breeder, a cocker spaniel breeder, and you, I mean, this was clearly somewhat, I mean, we were in her home. We were, it, we saw where the, the mom was, was, was living. We met the dogs in her space. Um, she was so obsessed with these dogs being placed well. She even insisted on, on chiming in on her, on the animal's name because it was an English Cocker Spaniel. And so she insisted that she have a proper English name. And when I compare a breeder like that to some of the places that y'all end up seeing in some of your un- undercover work and in, in the reports that you are compiling every year, it's just like it's night and day um well kathleen thank you so much for being here um i I was hoping just so maybe we can close out with a little advice for anyone who is thinking about adding a puppy to their lives and in their family's lives what would be your first steps as someone someone who interacts with sort of materials all day long that tell you where not to get a puppy right well i mean definitely check animal shelters and and rescues first I, i think i mentioned um the man I met at the phone store who got, you know, his beautiful Boston Terrier at a shelter and was so happy with her. Um, that do purebred puppies come into shelters every day? Maybe not, but you, um, but they do come in. And if you keep checking, you'll often find a, a puppy that uh, of your dreams, no matter what breed you're looking for. Um, uh, websites like shelterpetproject.org will help you find rescues near you. And um, if you do go to a breeder, just uh, take the time to slow down a little bit. Uh, make sure that you get to know the breeder, that you get some references uh, for their veterinarian, for other people that have purchased from them, um, and take the time to meet them in person, even if you have to drive a, a couple of hours to do that. Um, you'll be you'll be well investing that time because this is a puppy you're going to have for 15 years if you're lucky. And um, it's definitely worth it to make sure that you know who your breeder is and you know that the, the family, the, the canine family that your puppy came from is treated well. Kathleen, thank you so much. This is so helpful and, and good luck with the report. I know that every year it tends to result in some scrutiny of these places that they otherwise might not get, which is, which is great. Hopefully it will result in some changes this year. Kathleen Summers, Director of Outreach and Research for the Puppy Mills Campaign, Producer Pat. Uh, this is Carrie. This is Humane Voices, and we'll see you next episode. Thanks so much, everybody.